Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 607. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today's June 23rd, 2020. All right, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. It's odd that we use tuning in because you're not tuning in old television to get in or AM radio as they used to do back in the, the 30s and 40s. You are clicking. So thank you for clicking in to watch another Anglican Unscripted. If you have not yet subscribed to the program, now is a wonderful opportunity to click on that little red rectangle and then the bell next to it. You will get instant notifications when a new show appears. If you so desire, you can like the show and that helps promote the show. It's like free advertising. Click the thumbs up wherever you see it on Facebook or YouTube. If you have not become a commenter, and we have many, 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 many commenters on our show, we appreciate that very much. That's where the conversation continues. Please look for this show on YouTube and that's where all the comments appear. We also have a podcast. If you do not need to see us, but you don't mind hearing us, you can find the link to the podcast in the show notes where you can subscribe and it will automatically download to your phone. George, how you doing? I'm just fine. Mm -hmm. Surviving the pandemic. We have a daughter visiting uh, from uh, San Francisco mm -hmm. and uh, it's extraordinary hearing, uh, hearing about a different world, uh, different worldviews and everything. Oh, sure. I mean, I got to go to Pittsburgh with my wife. We took the the RV, which is a recreational vehicle for our international uh, audience. And we drove out to Pittsburgh and spent the weekend at a, a campground uh, uh, about uh, 40 minutes outside. It was uh, Pittsburgh. It was wonderful. We had wonderful cell service, as those who watched last week's program found out. And we got to hang out with our kids who are have a little different political perspective than we do but we had a wonderful uh time uh having burgers and lots of high calorie bakery items well you'd be lucky you would at least get burgers i get uh, tofu turkey and uh, vegan uh what are the, the those fake hamburgers that uh, yes tofu ham yes uh, i can't believe that's not hamburger <laughs> <laughs> I can so, believe it's not hamburger. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, okay, so there's a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, it happened a couple weeks ago, almost three weeks ago, Bishop Jackson, um, Bishop of the Great Lakes, was uh, suspended as a bishop, uh, disciplined, and they're going to find another bishop for that diocese. We had not reported on it because we had so many other breaking news items, and it's not that we're avoiding the story. It's just that uh, uh, if we sat down and talked about all the Anglican stories, including Indian corruption, we could have 40 hour episodes. And sometimes George and I have to sit down and say, what are we gonna talk about today? And sometimes things that are important just don't make the top five list. It's time to cover some of the things that didn't make the list before. Uh, Bishop Ron Jackson, I videotaped and live streamed his consecration a couple years ago. He's a wonderful man he had an issue with pornography and was not able to resolve it and was asked to step down was disciplined and that's kind of the story george it's a little more extended but essentially that's yeah. it in a nutshell yeah. um one of as an aside it's sometimes hard for us to report on these stories because there's more than just the bishop involved there's his wife there's yeah. his children there's the diocese. They're the people who have invested in him in spiritually and emotionally, and he's let them down. Now, the particular facts in this case are the bishop had a problem with pornography, and he got help, and he went through the canonical process because it was discovered, and they went through the steps to sort of get him out of that, into rehab, if you will. Mm -hmm. He lapsed and the lapse and he returned to it so we're told by people in the diocese and after having hadn't been given a chance the house of bishops said this is this is a line where we're going to draw so people like to compare this to the bishop in michigan the episcopal bishop who was suspended for a year for adultery why is the episcopal church so soft 
and only giving a year-long suspension while Bishop Jackson is kicked out for unknown reasons. Well, not defending whatever the Episcopal Church does, but this was, if you will, a first offense, and the guys promised to be good and uh, sit in the corner for the next year. Bishop Jackson has already gone through that, and this is a second offense, if you will, on the same issue. So if the bishop, Wayne uh, Hoagland, in Michigan has another affair, he'll be tossed out on his ear by the Episcopal Church because he's basically a two-time loser on this issue. So it, it, when you talk about clergy discipline and people's shortcomings, it's really never helpful to compare apples to oranges or to say, well, why did the, they're more serious or they're meaner or they're more lax. We don't know the details and we don't know what's in people's heart. Just the only thing that can tie the two together is that here we have two men who have fallen short in the careers and in the ministries God has given them. And they're paying the penalty right now of shame they, and loss of, uh, loss of their ministry. They, either permanently or for a year. They deserve our prayers. They deserve, you know, to be loved members of our communities. But um, to be in the bishop status is to be above reproach. Mm -hmm. um, and the Episcopal Church has kind of let that down in the last 20 years. But the ACNA has really held that standard for their clergy. I can think of personally about eight different situations in the last 10 years where the ACNA has come up against uh, clergy who needed discipline in some respects, held them to the discipline, and the clergy repented and returned to ministry. And in other respects, maybe 70% were disciplined and they were not able to return to ministry and the, the ACNA followed through and s disciplined them to the point where they were uh, taken out of the ministries. And I, as a member of the ACNA, I appreciate that. It's hard. I know it's hard, but I appreciate that. There's an old saw that the three things that get clergy are sex, money, and alcohol. Mm -hmm. And I have to say there's truth into that. Uh, I've reported on sexual scandals of adultery, of illicit relationships, of sexual abuse. I mean, the most shocking ones are, the, are well, uh, Peter, uh, Bishop Moore of New York, who in the 70s and the 60s was, was the lion of the Episcopal Church. Mm. You couldn't get any higher up the food chain. You couldn't get on the, he was on the cover of Time magazine. Well, when he retired, Mark Sisk, the new Bishop of New York, I think, came in and suspended him from any active ministry. And it was only after his death that Andrew Deutsch, the current bishop, issued an apology to all the people that Bishop Moore sexually molested. Um, and this is somebody that, you know, your mother or my mother would see or grandmother would see on the TV and say, I'm proud to be an Episcopalian because look at the leaders we have. Yeah. Here's a man who won... I don't know, it was the Navy Cross or uh, Silver Star or something Silver Star, in, yeah, yeah. In, in, on Guadalcanal, a Marine Corps officer. And just, you never know how sin, how Satan works. Satan works to destroy and corrupt and devour us. And we should not tolerate that in our leaders. But at the same time, we should not seek their destruction as human beings. No, Billy Graham was always famous for saying, if you're going to pray for me, pray that I am never tempted by money and never tempted by uh, uh, sex or, or women. You know, mm -hmm. I, and that uh, because when you are high profile, and I know we are high profile, I know the temptations that come about in being high profile, um, Satan really wants to destroy you. Uh, mm -hmm. He does not need uh, people who are image bearers of Christ, imitating Christ uh, in very public ways. Does not want that in any shape or form. In my uh, class in seminary, I can think of two people who've been bounced out from the ministry, one for sex mm -hmm. issues and one for uh, money issues, and both had troubles with alcohol. And knowing them, they weren't bad people. They had the highest motives. They were the purest motives. But they dealt with the pain of ministry, mm -hmm. the loneliness, the stress, the I can't do anything about it, partially through alcohol. Mm -hmm. They would numb themselves 
And I guess that numbing led them down a path that one led him to the adultery and the other led the other fellow to fiddling his, uh, the books. Yeah. And, you know, it's not that these are evil people who set out, oh, I'm, this is the easy way for me to meet women is to be a priest, or this is the way to be a really good career criminal to be a priest, but rather Satan seeks the destruction of people who do God's will. I had a pastoral anecdote. In my parish in Sebastian, Florida, 20, gosh, 20 plus years ago. Where's Sebastian, Florida? Sebastian is just north of Vero Beach. Is that guy? Right? It's my first parish. I wasn't happy there, but next to, not next, but within about a mile away was a commune called Kashi Ranch. It's just like the Whole Foods Company, but this was a commune led by a Jewish woman from Brooklyn called Ma, and she, they were all Hindus, and they would get involved in yogi flying and transcendental meditation, and they lived in a commune. And one of the people left the commune and started coming to my church, and he said, well, you know, we call upon uh, the demons of this world to destroy the ministers and their families around us. Now, he may have just been trying to get me on edge. I don't think so, because he repented of his former life. But there are people who seek to destroy the church, and one of the avenues is through destroying the clergy. Mm -hmm. And so we need to hold up these poor men and women who are humans, they have flaws and failings, and just pray that Satan not find a way to crack open the gospel protection that they that I pray they're covered with. Well, and here we have to say, you know, anybody can fall. Mm. Well, first of all, we're all sinners, and you need to be praying for all bishops all clergy, uh, all people who are in, in leadership that uh, this does not happen to them. Uh, mm -hmm. And be earnest in your prayers. Um, uh, bishops don't want to fall, and clergy do not want to fall. It happens. Uh, there is a way to repentance and reformation. Uh, and we, we pray that they, they would seek that as well. I think we've covered this enough. Uh, it's a tough topic. Uh, it's not that we don't want to cover it, but uh, these are real people and you know the issues and you know that uh, you can help them by, by being in prayer for them. So, Jordan, Skev, we've done sex. Do you want to do money now? Or <laughs> let's do a tourist church versus real churches. Um, let's talk about the Washington Cathedral. Story came out that uh, they're laying off staff. Uh, you and I talked about right before this pandemic really took hold and the first wave was starting and they're starting to close churches that there are churches around the world in every province and every diocese that are not going to survive the pandemic and i thought of lots of churches i never thought of washington cathedral i never thought trinity would have trouble but now that we're into this the second wave and we're coming down here we're seeing you know some of the stowards of the episcopal church are struggling uh, as this first wave, you know, slightens out a little bit, uh, Washington Cathedral gets a lot of their money through tourism, and they, they're laying off a lot of tour staff. Yeah, uh, I was looking up as you were talking. I wanted to pull up the letter which we published in Anglican Inc. from the Dean mm -hmm. Randy Hollerith. He sure. wrote to the members of his congregation, mm -hmm. and the paragraph I wanted to read is. We have reduced the cathedral, cathedral full-time workforce by 15%. In the new fiscal year that starts July 1st, th th 13 full-time positions will be eliminated, as well as 13 part-time positions. 12 full-time positions will be fully or partially furloughed, and most of our part-time and contract employees will see their hours reduced. And the senior management, including the dean and the clergy, are all getting a 20% pay cut. They mean it. Uh, that's... Um, so they're laying well, off staff. Yeah, they uh, have an endowment. They have mon There's money there if they wanted to use it. Yes, but the endowment's really more tied to the structure and fabric of the building. Remember, they had that earthquake, freak earthquake, yep. and they had the damage. And they have money, but it's not money that they can blow through in salaries, salaries and operating expenses. It's mm -hmm. money to make sure the cathedral's there for a thousand years to keep the stone gargoyles and the foundation and whatnot. And with uh, 
the decline of tourism, the decline of public services. Watch any time a president dies, any time there's something or other, they hold a show at the Washington National Cathedral. And with three months, basically they're like a restaurant that's been closed for three months. Uh, they can't keep the busboys and the waiters and the hat check girl and the cigar girl, hmm. if there are such things anymore. I uh, the church. <laughs> not at a church. Well, maybe at an Episcopal <laughs> church, they had check girls and cigar girls. Uh, so, but this, uh, I read an, I, I, I forwarded an article about a visit to an Apple store by a tech writer to, to uh, Kevin, because mm -hmm. it really struck me as being an analogy to the Episcopal, to, to my Episcopal church. And the gist of the story was that the Apple store in the, this was in San Francisco, it was always a hub. It was a community. It was packed. It was a place that you not only went to buy technology and fix your products, but to be with like-minded people. Absolutely. And Kevin, you went to an Apple store. Uh, <laughs> I do. Well, for me, it's Geek Kingdom. Um, I was going to go out and visit my, my kids and uh, to guarantee that they'll come see Pops. I you know, I went and bought them new iPhones, and uh, I wanted. I went, bribery always works. <laughs> I went into the iPhone store, and it was a, a weird experience because security guards are everywhere, um, of all varieties, tall, short, thin, um, and they're in the store and outside the store. And there's three lines, so I get in the first line, the big line, and. Uh, they come up and the first thing they do is to make sure my mask is properly attached and then they, they aim at something at my forehead and take my temperature. Then they ask, uh, are you here for uh, repair or to buy something? I'm here to buy something. Oh, you're in the wrong line. So I go to another line and they take my temperature again and uh, then they ask again, are you here for business or uh, consumer product? Well, uh, business. So I get hoisted to another line where they take my temperature and kind of move me to the faster line as a business person and I go inside and when I'm inside I'm one of four customers in the store they have uh, four people you can talk to and they hustle me through I the whole transaction to buy a Mac Air and uh, two iPhone SEs took eight minutes that never happens in an Apple store. You're always waiting for somebody to process and find this and that. They didn't upsell me. Do you need a case? You know, they, just, they wanted me in and out of the store as quickly as possible because there's a line of people behind me. But this is the, this is the new normal in a pandemic. That geek, geekdom feeling where you're going amongst your people. That that social presence that I'm I'm welcome in the store and. Um, I'm amongst people who love this technology as much as I do. It's different, George. It's, it's, it's no longer there. It's gone. The message Apple was giving people is we really don't want your business, yeah. but we'll, we'll put up with it if you jump through these hoops. And where the analogy was hitting me strongest was this is what the churches are doing, uh, especially the Church of England. They're really mishandling this, of basically saying, you, uh, we really don't want your business. We... And they're, I don't mean to be unkind, but they're being all sort of self, uh, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson gave a speech to the House of Commons announcing the government's new policy and churches can now reopen uh, after July 4th or 5th? 4th July 5th. 5th. Yeah, that's... Saturdays, of, 4th is a Saturday, might be okay. the 5th. Uh, but you have to be two meters apart, which is about six feet or one meter plus if it's packed church and certain other little hoops. And the Church of England has announced, you know, had announced earlier that the churches are open for, open for private prayer. And I'm fearful for them, as I am fearful for my own congregation, that it's going to be big, so what? We needed you back when we figured out how to get on in life without you now. Yeah. We're not going to be, you're not going to be seeing us again. Uh, church, you didn't need us during the pandemic. We don't need you afterwards. You know, it's, I can't express to you enough the message that the Church of England gave off during the pandemic and some other churches around the world. The Catholic Church, I mean, the, the, mm. even I have older congregation that I have. I've got people going into the hospital all the time. And in the past, I'd get a call 
and the expectation was I'd be there. I'm not getting calls anymore. And part of it is, well, we don't want to bother you because we know uh, you may not be allowed in or this or that. But the pattern that's evolving is that the clergy are becoming optional. You really have to really, really, really want the minister to come for the hospital to allow you to get him into the room with you. Now, yes, I understand their public health concerns, but I, I'm maybe I'm being foolish, but I'm willing to risk those concerns on my part to be for there for a person who needs the ministrations of the church and needs somebody in a very difficult hour. And the pattern that we're setting, I live in Florida, as everybody knows, of an older demographic. I live in the fourth oldest county in the United States in terms of average age. Uh, a few counties over St. Augustine, which is the oldest county in terms of being founded, but different old. Um, I don't have a large young population. We don't have a lot a lot of children in the area compared the average age in the county is like 57 or 58 those people are not going to be rushing back in is my sense yeah the 60 70 80 year olds when the the doors are reopened uh our church started public worship again two weeks ago uh, and i told you guys that connecticut really never canceled public worship um and it's working people are coming as many people as can be filled into our church by the the twenty five percent rule, is, they're doing that. The rest are watching online, um, and it's encouraging to 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 watch the video and see people worshiping again. Their um, church is not the same. Well, Kevin, there's also yeah. the difference between I live in Christendom, mm -hmm. where the culture is that you're in church on Sunday morning. You're odd if you're not. Right. Um, so if you go to the supermarket at uh, say 11 30 12 o'clock on a sunday morning three quarters of the people will have church clothes on right uh connecticut you have <laughs> to want to go to church and you're yeah. so in essence the people who go to your church are more committed mm -hmm. whereas i have that committed core but at the same time i have a very large i don't want to say cultural because i don't wish to put anybody down but it's a more of a tenuous relationship with sure. the faith that is part of being part of a Christian culture. So Kevin's situation is much more like England than mine is. Mine is maybe, I don't know, well, more like it, Nigeria or someplace. Well, where yours people, is, it, it's more, is more... It's more habitual. Mm -hmm. You know, the habit is, this is our Sunday thing. Um, and the habit here Sunday is golf courses. Uh, to go grocery shopping at uh, 9 uh, a.m. in the morning and to get up and watch HDTV uh, reruns of all the stuff you're not going to do to your house. And so that's that's the habit here in, in the Northeast. And when you are driving on Sunday morning to church and you see other cars, except for the interstate, they're normally driving to church. There's not a lot of them, but you're like, ah, I knew he was a Christian. I, you know, when a neighbor hops in a car at at you know 9 30 on a sunday morning you, you, you're gathering information about your neighbors um and and one of the things i'm trying to figure out how to go forward because mm -hmm. my little mantra is that a church is like a shark if it's not going forward it's drowning uh, and we've been dead in the water for three months during that time we've had people die we've had people move away we had two people become the catholics one become lutherans god knows why uh, now that's just normal in church life people shop around they uh -huh. get married they do this that and, at the, and so you always lose people but what is different is during that time where we'd lose say 20 we'd gain 30 or 40. we've had no you know we've the uh, income side of the ledger has been at zero so that oh i'm just fearful of how are we going to restart this uh so what, one of the things I've been working on is uh, we do uh, I do four l Facebook live services on a Sunday, which is why I'm not able to film with Kevin on Monday morning. I'm dead. <laughs> one of them is uh, a contemporary service where we have a young man who's a 28-year-old mu professional musician who we've known since he was 10 years old, 
who plays uh, the guitar and he records from his room and his hair is too long and he has a nose ring and there's a Grateful Dead poster on the wall, but he sings wonderfully. He's a very good musician. Now musicians, because of COVID, are all out of work. That's right. He's desperate for the money and we, yeah. I want to help and I need what he's doing. And I've got a show, show, I've got a service where I feature his contemporary music because I want to be able to go forward to have a in-person service with that to attract that demographic of young people who really wouldn't know what to do if they walked into a typical Episcopal church with the organ playing and everybody's 65 plus. It's still packed, but it's not their culture. Oh, I, and that's so true. You take your an average 15 year old and you open the hymnal, they would not know how to sing verses through the or read the music it, it's different now it's completely different than the the age and the church i grew up in when i was young 17 18 19 alex p keaton was you know my hero on tv the conservative uh child brought up by liberal democrat parents and that's just that was the ethos that i knew and grew up on ronald reagan was president you love him or hate him he was presidential you know, he got up there and uh, when he gave a speech, like after the space shuttle exploded, the Challenger exploded, you felt sad yet wonderful and um, hopeful. There was always hope with what, with what he spoke of. And I kind of want to do a quick, we got like five minutes left here. Um, if you are on Facebook at all, you're finding that more people are just talking past each other. There's no longer conversations. And I think this has been happening for a long time. It just, Facebook has made this more evident. And that happens on the ACNA webpages, it happens on the Episco webpages, the Christian, the all different varieties and form are just using veracity and fallacies to accuse those who disagree with them. And um, there, it's discord. And you don't agree with me because you're a hater or you hate women or you're a racist or you're, you know, bring up the, the, the definition. And I, I see that more and more. And I can't imagine being a person who has to moderate a Christian community on Facebook anymore, George. The troubles of the world, the the hatred and the animosities and the partisanship and the absolute certainty of people who really don't know what they're talking about has infected religious discourse. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have otherwise sane people calling other clergy racists, or you have any, or some people who are active in their churches go to church. And any time a woman priest posts a comment, their response is not a response to the comment, but, well, you're a woman priest, you're going to hell, you're not a real priest. <laughs> now, this is not the place to debate women clergy and all this and that, but at the same token, how can you call yourself a Christian if you're, you're shouting racist, or you're shouting false priest, or you're shouting... Homophobe, or yeah, you know, all these different fallacies i mean we can't have have a discord we can't have conversation open conversation open table open discussion if we're going to use fallacies part yeah. of the part of uh, this is my opinion mm -hmm. so it means nothing except that i think it's true uh part of the acna episcopal structure is a reaction against the episcopal church's structure that's fair Episcopal bishops sound off on every issue, no matter what it is, and they always sound stupid, if, in my opinion. Very fair, George. <laughs> so that the ACNA has taken the opposite tack. They don't, their bishops don't say anything about anything. <laughs> they, so whereas the Episcopal Church, you know, bishops are free to tear into each other, to disagree, to take both sides of the issue. There are fewer taking both sides now because they've kicked all the good ones out, just about. The ACNA is not, its Episcopal leadership has pursuing collegiality, I think a little too far. Maybe to a fault. You know, they're pursuing it to the point where 
And I remember this early on, I was talking to two or three bishops in 2008 or nine in Plano and said, the rule is we're not allowed to diss another bishop. That's part of this whole structure. No bishop is allowed to say anything bad about another bishop's ministry or, or actions or stuff like that. I said, yeah, that's fair. But now they've taken it so far that um, bishops basically aren't speaking out on a lot of topics you would think they would uh, speak out on unless they're doing it in joint letters. You know, and, like and the, those joint the, joint letters really are they really are committee projects. You committee know. products, you know, and so I'm not learning the thought of individual bishops uh, in ministry, and I think it, it, a lot of it is fear. We don't want to turn up out like the Episcopal Church. Yeah, I, I get that, but I think a lot of it is, you know, at some point you have to also be individuals in, in your episcopacy and be able to promote uh, Jesus in your 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 new your unique way. I can't even talk after all this talking. It's it's not a call for the ACNA to get political. In other words, to start talking. Nope. About, that's not exactly what we're saying. Uh -huh. But while everybody else is being political. I think the world is eager and waiting to hear a Christian message of love and redemption and salvation that's just as powerful as the Trump is an evil, Trump is God's gift sure. messages that we're hearing. Uh, silence now, is a it, choice, it, but and, let's and be the sure it's not a smart one. I think I want this message to go to all provinces, to all bishops, to all clergy, not just the ACNA. It's okay to speak. It's okay to have an opinion. Um, yes, I know you don't want to be like tech, but that, that you know this is for everybody. All right. If Kevin and George can click on our cameras twice a week and, and give you our opinion, you as bishops, as consecrated uh, representations of uh, uh, Christ's kingdom on this world, you're allowed to speak as well. Um, George, that kind of covers the whole pro program until Friday when we do this all over again. I'm Kevin Carlson. Well, Indian, oh. well, can we do Indian corruption or is that? Uh, that's, we're gonna kick again, that can down the road a little we, far. Well, here's the problem. I mean, that's episodic. We would have uh, season one, episode one through 40, season two, episode 40 through whatever. I mean, that just goes on forever. And it's almost racist. No, 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 okay. I'm God, Kevin Carlson. Let's not go down that road. My daughter's I, been visiting. I don't need to. I don't need to have that fight on, on this show. I'm Kevin Carlson, and I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 607 of Anglican Unscripted.